Welcome to Rates and Barrels. It is Monday, April 24th. Derek Van Riper here with Eno Saris. On this episode, we dig into a recent piece that Eno wrote for The Athletic, looking at some early swing rate changes. We'll talk about some players who have adjusted their approach for better, maybe a few that have even adjusted their approach for worse in the early going. We've got a bunch of great mailbag questions spanning a variety of topics, how to decide on your drops in a, a 12-team league with pitching where there are so many seemingly high-performing pitchers on the wire and underperformers that you liked on your roster. How do you make those calls as you look at those decisions? Uh, early power uh, where where could you find it on the waiver wire? If your team is imbalanced right now, where are you going to go to get power on the wire? And where could you possibly go via trade and get power that isn't necessarily fully priced? I think that's the other part of the conversation that we're going to dive into today. But let's start with the swing rate changes. You know, this is always a good early season thing to look at uh, because it's one of these things that actually means something this early. Not many things actually do. But I think the most fascinating part of swing changes is that the adjustment isn't necessarily the same for everyone. It's not just swinging less. It's not just swinging more. It depends on who you are and where you were coming from. What you, what were your previous issues if you had issues and which of those paths actually fixes it? Yeah, I have to think about somebody like Trent Grisham who's swinging more and it's leading to more strikeouts, but it's also leading to him tapping into his power more. And probably on some is a better idea than leading the league in watching strike three go by. Mm-hmm. And so there's some relationship between how good your hit tool is to uh, how good your actual sense of the zone is, you know, what you can like see. Um, And if you don't have a great hit tool and you don't have a great sense of the zone, a lot of times you should swing a lot, right? Because then you just, you, you don't get to strike three. Like you get to contact before strike three. That was the Josh Hamilton way of thing, doing things, I think. But uh, for everybody else, I think generally, and, and this is, it's a funny thing too, when you do like correlations across the whole league or you like look at big, big trends and then you try to apply that to, to single players is that if you look at the league as a whole, swinging less is, is good. Teams that swing less win more. Uh, players that swing less have better OPSs and so on. A large part of that is walks, but it's not just that. And we found some things where like, if you swing at pitches in the zone and don't swing at pitches outside the zone, there's a relationship there to how good your batted ball quality is. So generally like not swinging at pitches outside the zone, still something I believe in. (laughs) It's uh, it's still something I believe in, but then you also have uh, Juan Soto, who is being super, super stingy on pitches inside the zone. I think he's down to a 30% swing rate. Uh, him and Alex Call are at like a 34% swing rate for the season. And um, when you do that, uh, you get tons of called strikes. And so I've been watching Juan Soto all weekend, and it's just called strike after called strike low in the zone. And... I don't know if his swing has always been this flat, but right now he has a very flat swing and it's not really designed to do damage on balls low in the zone. So he's stuck with this conundrum of, do I start swinging at pitches low in the zone? Do I figure out something I can do with those pitches? It's like the opposite of when Kyle Schwarber came up. And uh, I don't know. Are you at all worried about Juan Soto? I think the longer this goes, the the more the little bit of worry I have grows. But at the same time, if you look at it from just a pure numbers perspective, it still looks really good. Rest of season projections all still have Juan Soto hitting 25 home runs the rest of the season. We talked about the hard hit rate, the barrel rate a little bit, I think, at the Wednesday episode last week. Those things are still good. He's still making the quality of contact that he needs to make to be as dangerous as he can be. This seems more like a mental adjustment than anything else for him. And if we look at his resume for through six seasons now in the league or parts of six seasons in the league, he's on that short list of players that you would fully trust to make the necessary adjustments on the fly. We talked about it, I think, with Freddie Freeman in the past. You're like, he's just the kind of guy that's going to figure it out. Soto's in that bucket. Elite of the elite sort of hitter, full understanding of the zone. What's really surprising is that he keeps getting burned as often as he does with those low strikes. And 
what is he going to do with that pitch if he starts hunting it a little bit more? What's the best case scenario if he's more aggressive with that? Is that a way of neutralizing Soto's power a little bit? Yes, he's, 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 not, on the he's power not good pitch. at those pitches. You're right. Right. So, so this could be the thing that makes him more of a 20 home runs for the rest of the season guy than a 25 plus, but it would probably help him get the, the average and the OBP and the run production all back, which if you, if you have Soto on your teams, you might, you might make that deal with the devil right now. You might say, yeah, it's fine. I'll get the extra power somewhere else. Just give me, give me 280, 290 with 20 bombs the rest of the way and a boatload of runs and RBIs. And that's, that's fine. I, I still think that's a reasonable sort of floor expectation for him. And that's an incredibly high floor for a player that looks pretty bad on the surface numbers right now. Yeah, I was, uh, I, I, he's taken, uh, my main event team down with him, but, uh, let's see, there's gotta be, there's gotta be more for him, but it's also, um, I think, uh, it's fun for me to see big swing rate changes in young players. And, I think um, one of the players that really, well, two are really interesting. One, we have to give Ian Khan his propers. <laughs> uh, I never, never foresaw this future for Jorge Mateo. And when you see in the box score, um, you know, or, or you, you check on Jorge Mateo's page, you say, oh, he's hitting 360 uh, and, uh, and he's hitting for power. Uh, this must all be uh, just a hot streak and I don't believe in it. When you start poking under the hood, there's actually been a change in approach. He's massively changed uh, his swing uh, percentages uh, to the point now that um, he, he he swings. He still swings a, like he swings about league average now. And, he's, and he chases pitches outside the zone about league average. And he, and he swings at pitches inside the zone a little bit above the league average. That sounds uh, like kind of not that much praise. But given where his plate skills were before, uh, it's an, a massive improvement. And you take a guy who obviously has the raw power, as you can see from decent max EVs, has the, the, the speed, and you give him average plate, plate skills in terms of you know, walks and contact and, and, uh, and chase and all that. You get, uh, I don't know, a star. <laughs> I mean, like, mm. I think he could be an all star for them. And I think he could put up a four win season. And uh, I never thought he would have a strikeout rate of, you know, he's right now at 17%. Obviously, the rest of season projections are like, no, no, no it's going to go back up to 27%. And I get that. But the swing strike rate has changed. The chase rate has changed. The swing rates are changed. I kind of feel like, maybe he regresses to like a 20% strikeout rate for the rest of the season. And I'd put his over under on seasonal strikeout rate at like at 20% or, or 19, even like I, that's how much I believe he's actually changed things. And as much as I want to give Ian Khan's proper is like, he didn't do this last year. Last year, he was just about the best. I thought he could be given his flaws this year is I think what, what Ian dreamt up. Yeah, I think this was in the ceiling range outcomes, but even last year without the changes, it was basically a boatload of power and speed at and minimal cost and defense for the Orioles' sake. Right. Good enough counting stats in deeper leagues. I mean, if you were in a shallow league, you were maybe lagging a little bit, but you were still so happy with the 35 steals for next to nothing, and it came with more than non-zero power. I think this points to a question. Can you spot adjustments, changes, or flaws in players faster than the projection systems do. We talked about some of the changes that uh, had already taken place with Alec Manoa's projection and everybody else's through three, four starts. And for player, for hitters, it's like 15 games when we last spoke about this. But it's kind of like a another way to put it. Would you rather for the rest of this season have Jorge Mateo or Gunnar Henderson? Because it's two players where you could look at the rest of the season projections and kind of argue your way up on Mateo and down on Henderson based on what you've seen in less than 20 games. And I, I think that can be a really slippery slope, but I'm wondering if it's a necessary way to sort of maximize value. If you're going to trade for players and make moves for players, you might be in a league where people still don't believe in Jorge Mateo, where he has found money, where he was drafted as in a middle infielder. So he's an extra guy. 
And you might be in a league where people still think that Gunnar Henderson is easily a top 100 player for the rest of the season because of his pedigree and what he did last year and where he was drafted. And if you can leverage that effectively because you see it differently and you have good reason to believe that the projections might be wrong, that's kind of how you win in season with big transactions. Yeah, if, you, if, you're, if your uh, transactions allow it, I could totally see it. And one of the reasons is, and this is not getting at the, the quality of the player as much as it is f- how it fits into fantasy, is that your, your stolen base attempts are fairly sticky. So the fact that Gunnar Henderson has only attempted one steal uh, in three weeks does not suggest, as Zips has, uh, that he will steal 12 bases on the year. Um, and I think it just makes it much more likely that he ends up with five to seven stolen bases on the season. And um, so if he has five to seven stolen bases and is really struggling with contact and contact rate is in the wrong direction, now you're talking about a guy who, even by projections, is going to hit 240 with 15 homers and you're going to give him five steals. So even by projections, it's getting close. And then if you say, okay, what's going on here is, yes, the projections do have this in them, right? They do have, they know that like swing rate changes, stabilize faster. They have all that, but they, they regress it all anyway. And even when you say something is stabilized, it means that going forward, you only regress halfway to league average because you still have, you have half the information. So they're going to take, uh, you know, Jorge Mateo's uh, 11% swing strike rate um, and then regress it halfway to uh, the 15, 16% he had in the past and give him something like a 13% the rest of the way, right? And they're going to do this uh, because it's smart and that's what the numbers say you should do in the past. But then there are breakouts where they just sustain the improvement, you know? Um, and in this case, uh, you know, with the projections already saying it's kind of close and then all the needles being in the right direction on the small sample stats for Mateo. Yeah, I guess uh, it's not a, would you rather I would have ever expected to come down in this side, especially in late April, this stuff happens so fast and it's so, it's so jarring when you when you get to that point. You're like, ooh, maybe I would actually take Mateo if I were drafting today or <laughs> yeah. if that trade were, were sitting on my uh, on my screen. I think there's something that Jorge Mateo has in common with Adelis Garcia. And Garcia had a monster game over the weekend against the A's, but he's off to a great start overall this season. And he's continued to put up great numbers from a fantasy perspective. He's been a better player for a longer period of time than I would have expected. And I think what they have in common is a ridiculous amount of tools along with defense that keeps sort of the field. keeps them on the field. And I think the thing that I have tripped over in the past with these players, I've, I had Garcia for a dollar in a keeper league the year he came up, traded him as soon as I could because I just felt like it was going to be fool's gold. And that was a mistake. He's been a great keeper for our friend uh, Baseball Pods, actually, was on the other end of that trade. I think when you when you look at game power, raw power, speed, if you add those numbers up, let's say let's say raw power and speed. If you add up the 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 good the scouting numbers, right, the twenty to eighty scale. If the total of raw power and speed is like a one thirty or above, that's a good player that you want. It doesn't matter if they hit tools at thirty or thirty five, and it's kind of the the position player equivalent of what we talk about with pitchers when the arsenal, the individual pitches are great and the command stinks. And then we get a little fixated on that. And a lot of times those guys become relievers. And a lot of times these guys with no hit tool are part-time players and not everyday players. But when they become everyday players, they are significant exceeds in terms of where they go in drafts. And they tend to do it for a long, long time before the market fully catches up. We all tend to look at players in such similar ways. This is where I feel like if you you look at the pool the way that Ian does, I mean, Adelis Garcia is a huge Nando guy. Having some different perspectives, having some different thoughts about what to do with players like this can pay off in a really big way. And I just think with Garcia, we're actually seeing some of those changes because one thing that I've noticed for what feels like forever now, it's been at least five years that this has really kind of stuck with me. Even if you don't have the tools, you don't have the raw power and speed quite at that level. I think about just the glove first shortstops. 
Brandon Crawford may have been a glove first shortstop when he broke into the league. If you're good enough to play a lot, playing a lot gives you a really good opportunity to get better. And when you get better, you play some more. And then you can mm. extend your career from Crawford three to five to years to ten just years. Just on the glove, you know? Right. So and if you, he would you, never if, have gotten the chance to be the player that he was without that glove. So I think that can open up the, the door for you to reach another level that you know, the scouts, and this is not a this is zero percent critique for scouts. Like they, they see what they see, they project off of that. They can't they can't know how long a team is gonna stick with a player because of defense and then project on top of that. I feel like that's an absurd thing to expect someone to do. But maybe the lesson in all of this continues to be not neglecting the quality a player is uh, brings the, to the defensive side because of all the opportunities that presents, and not getting fixated on the one tool, and the pitcher side command, and the, the hitter side, the actual hit tool, if everything else is as good as it is for Mateo and Garcia and other players like this. They are certainly not the, the first players like this to come through and later than expected sort of deliver on, on hype they may have had when they signed as prospects. Is, this, is there, are there other players that we can learn from about this on? Is Joey Weimer's defense in center this good? I mean, I'm just, I've just got the UZR. It's a terrible thing. I should have outs above average up at least or something. It's, it's a great by outs above average so far too. And I think we get, you know what? Weimer is a really good similar player because he had 70 raw power, 70 speed, current 50 in the field with 60 future. I think he's showing that he's a 60 in the field. He plays center. He plays it well. He plays right, has a big arm. I think it's going to be up and down with the bat for a little while. The difference for me compared to the situation for Adelis when he broke in with the Rangers and the situation for Mateo in the Orioles rebuild is the Brewers are trying to win right now. So the playing time and their more depth. Offense out of that. If they can get more offense out of that position, they need it. Right. Their depth could make this a, a bit of a, a problem. But. Garrett Mitchell's injury is a big time injury. So now that Mitchell's hurt, we were being able to play center field and play it well, I think creates a much better playing time floor than he had when he was the first guy up after Luis Urias got hurt. So I think Joey Weimer is a great example of a guy that hasn't done it anywhere near this level yet. Cause he's only been in the big leagues for 21 games, but he has that same package of tools that people have. And they, I think he's been underrated as a prospect relative to what he's shown in little flashes so far. And I'm not saying that cause I'm a Brewers fan. I'm saying that cause I've just happened to watch this guy a lot. And I think it was, it was too easy to fixate on his flaws and say, Oh, he had a 30% K rate at double a last year. I'm not interested. He had 15 steals and he was 25 for 26 as a base dealer in 84 games. And he wasn't too old for the level. Let's talk about that. That's probably more interesting if we're putting that on a package of someone that can actually play a yeah, very good to, center field. I tend to really gravitate toward those plate skills and, and, you know, and miss on this type of player. So it's just a fascinating discussion for me. I think that on the defensive side, a name that comes to mind is Yu Chang mm. or uh, perhaps, um, I think Zach Nito is uh, Neto is important to bring up here. Um, if the defensive numbers are to be believed, Michael Massey. These are three players that do have some interesting aspects to their lines. I'm not saying that they're only defense, but if their early season defensive numbers are to be believed, Yu Chang might get a really long look at shortstop. He might even be the Boston shortstop all year because you're talking about putting him up against Kike Hernandez, Ad Adalberto Mondesi, and a, a noodle arm Trevor Story. Um, and, and so there's an opportunity there for him to just finally play all the time, you know? Um, and I think, you know, the way he's been passed along from team to team, he's 27, he's been on a bunch of teams on four teams last year. Um, and so people kind of think, oh, this is a utility guy, strikes out too much, doesn't walk enough, this is not going to work. But let's say you give him, he finally gets that everyday opportunity and he is playing it's not quite there yet, but if he did play every day, like what if he got that strikeout rate down to 25% and he did finally show that power on a regular basis? Now you could be talking about somebody that could be relevant in fantasy. Michael Massey's struggling, but if he's, I mean, he, he's not going to be worse than Nicky Lopez with the bat. Um, and, uh, well, right now he is, I guess <laughs> it's a minus 32 WRC plus. I did not know it was that bad. Uh, but if the defense is actually decent enough, that might buy him more time to find what he had last year, you know? 
Um, and then if you're thinking about Neto and you're like, oh, he's just going to be up for a little bit and then, you know, they'll, they'll find something else that works. Um, if he struggles, I don't know, man. I think it's a little bit like Volpe where you're like, no, he's a great defensive shortstop and we're going to start with that. We're going to put him in the bottom of our lineup. And if he figures the rest out, bueno, but like otherwise, you know, we just need him in there. Um, so those are that that just came from sort of a out of average uh, uh, sort where I'm, I'm looking through here. Maybe is it going to buy two ranks sometime or is he already down? Um, I think with Tur Bryce Terang, I think did something that always throws people for a loop. He had a amazing first week and it included a big home run and <laughs> power <knows> that. <laughs> power is it's, it was like a grand slam in the home opener. It's like, that's nice. awesome. Great story. <laughs> And, and now he's striking out 30% of the time. Now he just looks like the player you would have expected him to look like. I, I, it's so hard. When, when the first week is good, or the first 10, day, first 10 games are good, we want to believe it's real. Yeah. I think Terang could be a little more up and down this year. I, I think compared to Weimer, I think they can mix and match at second base a little bit more. They got guys like Mike Brasso and Owen Miller. At any point, they could just give those guys a little more time against same-handed pitching. Eventually, Luis Arias comes off the IL. It's probably more like June at this point. I think he's in 60-day IL now. But the, the, you're going to take some growing pains. Terang looks like a pretty good defender at second for what it's worth, too. So maybe that keeps his, his bat in the lineup, uh, depending on how the rest of the lineup is hitting. I don't know if that answered your question, but... <laughs> I think we both agree that Milwaukee's a little bit more uh, complicated. It's complicated because they're trying to they win need, now. I, they, they, and they need offense. I mean, and, and mm -hmm. they can't give away that many positions. Yeah, and, and fishing in this pool, I think, is easier to do when you're talking about a team that's not currently under pressure to win a lot. Um, I'm looking at the... There's a great page over at Fangraphs, several great pages, actually. I highly recommend you support Fangraphs with some money because it's good to, to keep that running. But the board, the prospect board, which has, which has scouting plus stats, it has the four columns down the middle with all the tools. And you can just go down. You can just eyeball it, do the mental math, and look at that raw and that speed combo. The number is probably more like 120 or more. Like a 60 I, and a yeah. 60 is good. I have, this, I have this sorted for raw uh, raw power, and I'm looking at the, the speed guys with it. So uh, uh, here's a, a name for you right off the top is James Wood, but everybody loves James Wood, right? So, you know, what about Elijah Green? He has a 20 present 40 future hit tool, 70 raw power, 70 speed, right? So, what's our cutoff here? Do you think, do you think a 20 hit tool is where you say, nope, nope, no thanks? Like a 30 is the minimum, a 30, I know. a and 30 do these guys struggle to, to start the, their careers. You know yeah, I, mean? I, don't, I don't know if 20s make it to the big leagues unless you're talking about guys who are at the very, very beginning of their career. So if you're and a rookie ball or a ball. He's a 19 at least. Uh, Elijah Green. But I also, does this player type struggle when they first get the big leagues? Adulis Garcia had to be rele like released. Yeah, he had to be released. Jorge Mateo is on his third team, right? Right. So this may not be the type of player that you want to target as a prospect coming up. Right, maybe I don't know the type of player that you just keep an eye on, especially if they struggle at first. Like, if Elijah Green comes up in three or four years, three years, and struggles at first, remember that he had this seventy raw power, seventy speed combo, and and that it may not just happen right away for him. I think your your uh, your best use cases generally for this group end up being things like draft and hold leagues, mono leagues keeper in dynasty you're not necessarily taking these guys when they're 18 19 years old you're looking to scoop them up after that second or third team claims yeah. them when yeah. nobody wants them and they're on the wire and you can go pick them up for nothing or for a buck if it's a fab situation because you see playing time and you see tools and you say what could go right um, a current example close to the big leagues too travis swaggerty i still think based uh, on the tools travis oh, swaggerty yeah, is really it. interesting let me do so. This goes back to 20. To, how far back should I go? 2020, 2019. Let me do the 2019 report. We have fallen into a rabbit hole, but it's actually a great it's rabbit hole. One. Okay. I'm in 2019 and I'm doing the 130 rule and I'm coming up with Joe Adele. <laughs> yes, of course. Of course. I was going to come up with Joe Adele. We Christian, all know it's going to Christian happen Robinson. Someday. 
Well, okay. That that Arizona. was that was a bit of a detour for some unusual reasons. Yeah, but still, you know, could so still I guess be there eventually. Will Benson. All right, so Will Benson. Okay, just second team. Chance. Second team right now. Yeah, struggling to break through on the roster. It might not be in Cincinnati. It might be up and down with Cincinnati until he runs out of options. And then age 27, Will Benson, who at that point will have taken up a full closet of Nando's house with rookie <laughs> cards, will be getting a chance with the then awful or still awful Colorado Rockies. And it'll click. It'll just it'll be one of those things where it's just now. Now, I actually it won't be the Rockies because I think there's something about these orgs that actually can occasionally bring something out of a player so bad bad fit but it could be one more it, it could be now it doesn't it doesn't have to follow the same pattern as mateo at least garcia i think was just one org right he was st louis and then texas it's not always this long winding road taylor it just doesn't trammell taylor trammell's got interesting skills and taylor trammell i think controls the zone better than a lot of these guys a, a lot of these players have a little more of an aggressive free swinging approach that's why at least garcia i believe was in the, the list, the table at the top of your piece from last week. Taylor Trammell, I've, I've always felt like when you look at his numbers, you see good walk rates, you see pretty manageable strikeout rates. He's just blocked right now in Seattle. If you're a team that needed a young outfielder and you want to take a chance on someone, Taylor Trammell seems like a great player to call Jerry DePoto about. This is his last year with options, by the way, so it might be a 2024 opportunity for Trammell somewhere outside of Seattle. Yeah, it's an interesting uh, type of player that um, we we're just watching two of them happen right now. Um, you know, back to back to the swing rate changes. Um, you know, I, I generally the way that I try to think of it is it's change, right? And we you don't always know if it's for the positive or negative because things like slugging percentage or isolated slugging, even strikeout rate, are not stable, quote unquote, right now, right? So you can't you can look to those for hints. But sometimes just change and change alone is good. And so I have Spencer Torkelson in there. And in terms of, you know, like WRC plus or slugging percentage or OPS or batting average, any result stat, it doesn't look like he's changed, you know, or at least it doesn't look like he's changed for the better, you know? <laughs> um, and so it's no one would point to this and be like, oh, Spencer Torkelson might be figuring it out. However, if you look under the hood, he's absolutely more aggressive than he's ever been. And I was talking to a, a friend that watches the Tigers more often and said, yes, he's got he's trying to get the ball out front and he's trying to to slug the fastball. And it's made him uh, it's made him more um, susceptible to the breaking ball away. Right. Um, and that's that's going to happen. However, I would say in response, A, if he's more susceptible to breaking ball alone away and he's making more contact and striking out less, maybe maybe this is a better way for him to go. You know, his barrel rate is up. His max EV is up just a little bit. And then number one is it's change because what he was doing last year wasn't working. <laughs> so, you know, we've got a former 1-1 here who's changing. I think that that means it's good. It's good because he was terrible and change needed to happen. So you're never going to get a like, especially in these dynasty leagues where they're all on fan graphs with you, you know, and they're all listening to your damn podcast. You know, you're <laughs> never going to get a, a buy low where, you know, it's you're sure of it. Right, <laughs> like if you're sure it's a buy low, the other guy's sure too, and he's not going to trade the guy to you, you know. Um, and I think there's enough doubt here with Spencer Torkelson where I'm like, you know, I think there's a lot of people who are like, this is okay. We're getting to the point where this is just not. I don't have anything to hang my hat on, you know. I don't. I don't have anything where I'm like, oh, he's at least doing this. And the thing is that I have to hang on my hat on is he's changing. And that's about all I have. I can't even tell you if it's for the good or for the, for the worse, but he's changing and it couldn't be worse than before, right? <laughs> right. She's trying. So if you want a reason to buy it, it's that he's not doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting a different result. He's not exactly. following the definition of insanity right back to Toledo. And if he is moving the contact point out in front and not striking out more and making the same amount of contact, it could just click. You know, that that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to, the, there's more power out in front of the play. He's trying to get to that. 
and bless his heart. Because <laughs> he still has a 60 WRC plus. And they, they even moved the fences in for him, I feel like. <laughs> but I, I I mean, I, I don't want to put the like grade A, you know, buy the whole thing on there. Because obviously there's a lot of doubt, even in my own mind. But there's change here. And, uh, and you know, there is some pedigree to put your hat on, 1-1, one, one, you know. Uh, the max EV is not bad, 112, you know, that's not bad. And the, the strikeout rate combined with max EV is not uh, something that a lot of people uh, have in common. You know what I mean? Yeah. All right. So you're you're in. You're, you're in on, on Spencer Torkelson as someone to trade for right now. I think based on the piece, you're still in on Nathaniel Lowe, right? That seems like more of the same. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's changing some, but um, yeah. I don't know. I, I, I think that he doesn't need to change that much. I think that you can just be like, you know, worst case scenario, I get, I get 275 with 20 homers. Like, what's so bad about that? You know, I just, I think the thing I like right now, the K rate is actually down a little bit. Ground ball rate's down again. I like that as an adjustment for him. If he keeps hitting the ball in the air, good things are going to happen. That power should come back around. Uh, we had a question from Manny about Josh Lowe. I thought Josh Lowe was going to be in your piece. I was a little surprised looking at the table. I'm like, Josh Lowe's got to be in here. Uh, I think you just narrowly, narrowly missed it for the criteria you used. But here's what's going on with Josh Lowe. Uh, he is swinging more. He was swinging 46.1% of the time last season with the Rays. He's up to 50.4%. Uh, he's swinging more in the zone, up from 64.7 to 67.7. And he's swinging more outside the zone, 25.6%. To 29.1%. He is just a, a, attacking more. And I think it makes me wonder if with Josh Lowe, we've always looked at his profile and said he strikes out a little bit too much, but he draws walks, so it works. And he gets on base enough, and he's he's got some speed, he's got power. All those things are all good things, so he's going to play eventually. He's going to be a big side platoon outfielder for the Rays, and it's all going to fall into place. It's falling into place so far in terms of the improved results. He's cut his strikeout rate more than in half. I don't know if we can look at what he's doing with the more aggressive approach and say, that's the end That's the end point. That's where he's going. He's mm -hmm. going to keep this K rate in the 15% range, and, and this is an incredible development. This seems like a small step forward that's been accompanied by a much greater uh, change in result than expected. Like It's it's like a, a good adjustment for him, but... I'm not buying that as the new normal for him. Barrel rate's up right now, too. So that's a good sign, too, making uh, more damaging contact when he connects. So lots to like with Josh Lowe. But where do we go from here, given all that we've seen in the upper levels of the minor leagues from him? The reason I'm buying is that he was a low ball hitter that could not make contact on pitches high in the zone last year and yet he swung at them because he knew he had to do something or else he'd be out of the league you know what i mean like this he knew that they had a hole that they were attacking and he swung at them this year he's swinging at them more but he's making contact at the top of the zone if i could show you this heat map it'd be it's it's amazing he's making contact in the 90s high in the zone um you know he's got a 97 up middle middle straight 86 even at the very top of the zone uh, you know, and he's, he hits the ball better in, uh, up and down. So he's still got a hole, uh, kind of high and away, but the small, the hole is so much smaller. I mean, the heat maps are, are amazing. Maybe we can, uh, find a way to put them on the, the show notes, maybe put a link in there, but, uh, you know, the it's night and day. And, uh, that to me suggests that he's figured, he's figured something out big time. And again, you're taking the heat maps, you're taking, the, uh, the 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 numbers that are good in small samples, you, and you're saying, okay, the numbers that are good in small samples are telling me there's a change. And then when I go to the heat maps, they look good. And then the results are good. I mean, I think he's this is a guy who's putting it all together. I think he's a good reminder of what we were talking about earlier, though, that you can see these tools and you can like these tools. You can see good enough results to where you believe in the player and you can be wrong and you can be wrong and you can be wrong again. And then you can be right because I've been <laughs> wrong. I've got the Josh Lowe... I've been wrong hat trick and it, it didn't come with a t-shirt or a hat or anything, but it, it's you're been, trying to get him in 21 thought he was ready. And then I thought he was ready. Yeah. How it coming off 2021 when he had the, uh, the 22 homers and the 26 for 26 season as a base dealer. How could I have Josh Lowe everywhere last year? How would he not play a lot? And after he was that? great in the minor leagues in 2022 and horrible. Well, not horrible. It was, they see he wasn't horrible. No, he was 
he was just okay. adjusting. He was just yeah. getting by. And I think this is where, if the team is contending, the threshold for you to keep getting those opportunities mm-hmm. to not be a piece of the machine, which is the case for contending teams. Like, how do you fit our roster right now? How is our way? How is our best path forward with you in the lineup? Sometimes, that's the issue. That makes you a little bit of an up and down guy when makes somewhere else he would have played to buy Ray's prospects. Honestly, I mean, you just think of Jonathan Aranda, Vidal Bruhan. Yes, they have ones that have worked out. I'm not saying that Ray's prospects don't work out. It's just that everyone's on an up and down cycle, you know, and you and you don't know when they're going to break through. A lot of times they do eventually break through, but they kind of yo-yo around until they get there. Yeah, and I think you just sent me the screenshot that you wanted for Josh Lowe, so let me pop that up on the screen there. Bam, look at that. This is his new contact rate. It doesn't even matter what pitch type. I'm just, this is a guy who used to have a whole high in zone. Yes, that that 78 middle middle high is not amazing, but it's not blue. You know, he's, I, this is a different guy, it looks like. I've learned blue is bad in yet another facet of life in the last two months. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's just, it's an indicator uh, on more than just beer cans. So. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's helpful, but it's an indicator nonetheless. But love love to see changes like this from a player that has had these tools, and not surprisingly, 60 raw power, 60 speed. I, I was in on, on low for a long time. 35 hit, future 40, according to Fangraphs. Oh, it's right in. Struggled his way till he made it. And I just think that struggle can be further complicated by team situation and how mm. patient they can afford to be. It's not that the Rays didn't want to play Josh Lowe more. It's that they had a plan for winning as many games as possible, and that included him not playing nearly every day. We have to live with that. It's part of our part of our analysis, part of what makes the game so fun and, and so so difficult. Uh, is anybody else in this piece that you wanted to bring up on the pod? I know people can read it, of course. A dollar a month to get in the door at the athletic.com oh, wanna, slash rates and barrels. I did want to highlight the other side. Uh, um, downside, yes. And I did want to say that it's kind of interesting. So the way that I did this was I just looked at people who had improved their strikeout rate, their, 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 not their strikeout rate, who improved their swing strike rate, because that and swing rate are the two most powerful small sample numbers for base, for, 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 for uh, position players. So I, I, I looked among the people who improved their swing strike rate, and then I sorted by the absolute value of swing change, right? And so what you found was of the top 20, it, that had improved their swing strike rate, like 18 were swinging less, hmm. you know? And somebody came to me about denominators and stuff, and I, and I did not explain myself well. Swing strike rate is uh, swings and misses over pitches. And yes, if you swing less, it can, there is a toggle there, right? You swing less, that's part of swing strike rate. However, I, I'm just going to take a step back and be like, these guys are swinging less and they're making more contact. You know, in fact, you could have, you would make more sense if the swings were higher for your swing strike rate to go down in some ways. So I know there's a relationship, but just looking at this, you're like, oh, look at the people who improved. Oh, look, they're all swinging less, right? Now look at the people whose swing strike rate has gotten worse and they're all swinging more. So uh, in the top 10 of, uh, of people who have, have worse swing strike rates now sorted by absolute value in their swing change. These are the guys who are swinging more. Brandon Drury, Yasmani Grandal, Jake Cronenworth, Trent Grisham, Isak Paredes, Christian Walker, Jerickson Profar, Brendan Donovan, Jonathan Daza, and uh, Austin Hayes. So all those guys are swinging more and they're missing more. And it, it hasn't been a good choice for most of them but not all of them some of these guys are trying to unlock some power right and so trent grisham now is striking out 28 percent of the time uh because of this new approach but he's also finally hitting for power uh again you know and uh you know isak paredes is, is trying to take a, a kind of a hit tool friendly approach and add power to it a lot of these guys are trying to add power right a lot of these guys are trying to get out in front. Brendan Donovan trying to add power. So it's not an unqualified negative for all these guys. But I do say, if you already were a power hitter, and now you're swinging more and making less contact, like Brandon Drury, 
I'm kind of out on Brandon Drury. <sighs> yeah, Brandon Drury was a tightrope player for me anyway. anyway. And and I think it was reflected in his path to become an everyday player last year. I think there was a little bit of a warning sign after he was traded out of Cincinnati. We saw the production slip a little bit. It, it's a very risky profile. And I think it was easy to see why, even though there were some uh, some flashes. Like uh, last year was a career best barrel rate, 10.4% barrel rate. We know when we have an outlier like that, it's it's almost certainly coming down, right? If you split the difference between last year and his career rate, you're coming down to the 8% range. He's lower than that even right now. The K rate being through the roof, I don't think this is who he is. I don't think he's crashed and this is where he stays, but I think it makes it even less likely that the level he had over the course of last season, just in the combined slash line, it makes it so much less likely you're going to get that. The projections on Drury, 238, 240 average, it looks like. Actually, 236 to 240. Pretty much everything under 300 for OBP. ATC has got him at 302, so just a shade over. I mean, he's low 400s for versus slug. lefties only. Lefties only with the, we'll play you against righties when someone's hurt. Yeah. Because he, he can play all over, even if he doesn't play anything. Like when Jared Walsh well. comes back, like I think it's going to significantly affect his playing time. Right. This is so. This this Brandon Drury signing two for seventeen. I feel like it's um, another version of the Eduardo Escobar signing. Look at the way he functions on the Mets now. Drury's not quite as old as Escobar, but they're they're it's a little bit a, similar. It's not a name. signing that would ever like uh, kill a team. I mean, obviously no, not. No, no, absolutely not. But it is, uh, it like both of those deals. Uh, I, I, the Eduardo Escobar deal, I liked less than the Drury one. Drury one, I liked because I thought they needed depth, uh, and maybe that's how you can sell it. The Mets are okay with it because they're, you know, now Escobar represents depth rather than a starter. But um, yeah, I think it's also interesting. One name that I didn't mention who has his swing strike rate has gotten worse, but he's done it by swinging less, is Jazz Chisholm Jr. And I wonder if Jazz Chisholm Jr. should should actually be a free swinger, because I don't think he has good natural ball to, to uh, ball to bat, and he doesn't have I don't think the greatest sense of the zone. So I think I'd want him just swinging until he hits made contact, you know, rather than really waiting forever. So there's there's again like we said from the beginning, it's always um, it's not as easy as oh, this pitcher got a new pitch, or oh, his stuff plus is this. You know, it's like you're feeling your way through, through the dark a little bit with hitters, I feel like. I think Jazz has also uh, a, a more <laughs> unique background for a prospect having come from the Bahamas, right? I think the, the quality of the competition he saw at the very youngest ages was different than what prospects from the Dominican Republic or Venezuela or other countries would have seen, just given the state of baseball in the Bahamas, comparatively speaking, right? So that would give me a little bit more long-term patience with Jazz to make some adjustments. So if you think he's capable of doing it, if the if the long-term better outcome is being more patient, then see it through because the payoff could be massive. It could be an age 26, 27, big leap forward. He's already a good player, but maybe that absolute peak season where everything comes together for jazz comes a little bit later just because of all those other factors. And uh, for what it's worth, he's, you know, in our Adolis Garcia, you know, grouping. Sure. Yeah. Oh, loud, loud tools. Raw with power and, yeah. food. and, you know, he's a 60, 60, 60 uh, po- power and speed guy with a 40 hit tool. So, um, you know, I think we're watching a little bit of, uh, what it takes to succeed and the kind of like steps forward and steps backwards that he's already taken a few steps forward and backward in his career. Um, and to this right now looks like a step backward, uh, but it may just be a, 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 a bit of the learning cycle for him. Um, I still kind of believe in those tools long-term. And so he's not on the greatest list, uh, but I'm going to give him a bit of a pass here. Yeah, I think you'd find that most people who drafted Jazz where he was going uh, back in you know, February and March, they're still, still okay riding that. this out. Yeah, you're yeah. you're probably not getting that not person to move him though, until yeah. June or July. It's going to take a lot more of this before you can actually do something with it. But so I mean, I, like I, a 20-team OBP league dynasty where 
you know, his owner is looking at that 271 OVP and the plate skills and wondering if he, you know, actually is an asset. So, yeah, gives you, well, gives you a chance to, in longer term leagues, maybe make some kind of offer that previously would have been a flat out rejection. Let's move on to a few of the mailbag questions. I had a question here from Clayton about 12 team pitching drops. And uh, Clayton's problem is that he's got Dustin May, Jack Flaherty, Reed Detmers, uh, Garrett Whitlock, Anthony Descalfani, Dre Jameson. And then he takes a look at the waiver wire, and there are guys like Johan Oviedo and Drew Smiley and Mitch Keller and players with just better results so far. And I think this is one of the hardest formats to play in because it's not really a deep league, but it's not really a shallow league where it's just easy to go out and get something whenever a player gets hurt or when someone underperforms. So you do have to manage the margins well. You're going to make some mistakes. I think the first the first bit of advice I have about a 12-team league uh, drop question is you will make mistakes over the course <laughs> you, of the season. You will rue one of these choices. <laughs> the best players, the even the best players playing 12-team leagues are making mistakes in their drops. They're letting someone go uh, when the playing time is a little light or the skills look a little off and then a few weeks pass and that player is a must roster sort of player and someone else scoops him up and it happens. Yeah. If you're not making mistakes, I think this is something Scott Pianowski has said for years. I, I, it applies to all fantasy sports, but if you're not making mistakes with your moves, you're not making enough moves because mm. it's just part of the process. You right, think about batting average, right? Are you going to bat? Are you going to bat a thousand on the waiver wire and in trades? Of course mm. not, but you're going to get better the more you do this. So I guess the broader question is when you have a situation like this, we both play in some 12 team leagues. How do you make that decision? Because for me, like May, May is just he's safe. Dustin May is kind of a, a notch better than the rest of these guys. But Flaherty is not the Flaherty that he was a few years ago. I think that's pretty clear. Detmers was someone who unlocked a lot more with the old slider that came back midseason last year. Maybe he's more of a on again, off again sort of player in a 12 team format. Descalfani for sure is more of a streamer for me in a 12 team league. How do you break them down? Do you look at schedule? Do you look, it goes beyond the model, I think, too, but obviously that's part of your analysis all the time. But how do you sort of sift through which guys are on and off the roster and which ones meet that threshold? Is it rest of season projections? Is it model? Is it schedule? A combination of those things? Yeah, I think that schedule would factor in highly here because, you know, to some extent, you've got a grouping of, some guys in there that have kind of 97 to 101 stuff plus right and what's what's the real difference of one or two points of stuff plus probably not enough to overcome the schedule so to me the schedule is your answer there you identify which ones are schedule dependent and then you just move through them i don't like discofani's schedule coming up and i've got him in my main but in my main that's such a deep league that I keep him on my bench and I'm hoping for better, better times, but like he's home against St. Louis and I'm not starting him. So in your 12 team, if you, if he, if he's going to be home and you're not starting him at home, you got to let him go, you know? And so I, I think that's uh, where I, I stand with sort of Flaherty. Uh, so and Keller and Oviedo, I do like them. I didn't start Keller in Cincinnati. Mm. Interesting. I mean, tough part. I really like him, but like I, you know, a soggy lineup though, dude. It is. It is. It's and he did pretty pretty well, I think, if I remember correctly. So, um, I would I would rather have Keller and Oviedo uh, on my roster, and I think Oviedo is a little bit more in that Disclafani. Uh, Keller is a little bit more like I'm going to pick him up over Flaherty because Flaherty's fastball is not there, and he's not striking guys out, and I think it's going to be worse than it's been. So uh, if I want somebody that I can maybe pick up and keep for a while or have limits on moves or whatever, Keller is the name in the second group that I want, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, Oviedo to me is like a Discofani where it's like, oh, I love Oviedo at home. Yep. And I'm a little bit more nervous about Oviedo on the road. And so if you need a rule of thumb, like there are useful starters that have stuff plus between 95 and 100. There are lots of them. I'm not going to have a hard and fast rule there, but I would say that you're more likely to be schedule dependent when you're 95 to 100. And that's where that's unfortunately where Detmers is. It's kind of where Oviedo is. And, you know, Keller's free of that. I think it can be very helpful also to quantify this with the rest of season projections in the Fangraphs auction calculator. And it's interesting that 
I'm running the bat right now. Just look at the rest of the season numbers. The bat does not like Mitch Keller. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> Oviedo and Smiley are kind of similar. Drew Jamison similar. Um, Flaherty is similar to those guys. It, it did sort of break down similar to the way I expected, but it just gives you, I think it gives you a better sense of relative value. Is it perfect? Is it going to give you absolute clarity on every decision? Of course not. Well, You're still going to have to look at other factors. And another way you could do that is just the way that you kind of did it right there, where if you throw in the auction calculator and they're all like, there's like five of them in a group and half of them are free agents. You that answers your, your question. Yeah, that's, that's your streamers. That's the, that's the streaming level. For don't you. keep yes. don't keep one of them and think you know. Don't keep one of them or throw them in L.A. or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. don't throw one of those guys in in Colorado because <laughs> there's somebody else on the waiver waiver wire that's exactly the same that's going to be in Pittsburgh or in Miami or wherever. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Hopefully that helps a few folks out there, uh, even beyond Clayton. It's a common problem, uh, and it gets even more complicated when you're dealing with some injuries and you're kind of squeezed on the roster because then you have to either start someone in a spot you don't like, cut them and run the risk of someone else picking them up uh, because you know your, your ninth pitcher is your only healthy option. Uh, those are always, always very tricky. So tricky decisions. So hopefully we had, a, we had a, uh, uh, a heck of a time making decisions this week in Maine because uh, we have on our team Spencer Turnbull, Kenta Maeda and Anthony Discafani. And Anthony Discafani uh, will have days where we'd be very excited to pitch him. You know, either uh, just a home game against not a great team in San Francisco or maybe a two step where maybe a two step in San Francisco would be amazing. You know, like there are times we'd be like, oh yeah, we want Disco. Um, Turnbull this week has a double in uh, at Milwaukee and home against Baltimore where you're like, but the home against Baltimore is not on the schedule yet. So you're like, oh, I think he gets home at Baltimore, which is the one I want. And to get home at Baltimore, I also am going to throw the dice on this at Milwaukee, which I was like, I don't know. I know the model says I should like him, but, you know, there's obviously been some early season foibles with him. And then you have Kenta Maeda, who uh, is throwing 89. And his stuff plus numbers are good on the splitter and the breaking ball, but he throws 89. And he still throws the fastball enough where someone's going to get that 80 poo and rock it. And so, you know, sometimes I do actually then and, and this not to complicate the answer to that last question any further, but sometimes I do go into the per pitch and, and start making decisions that way. We almost dropped Maeda this week based on the fact that he has a 67 fastball stuff plus, even though his overall stuff plus is pretty good. So uh, what we ended up doing was uh, some conservative bids uh, for some players and with the idea that if we didn't get anybody, we would just end up with Maeda still. And that's that's what ended up happening for us. Um, but um, <laughs> the uh, the uh, the but but uh, in the end, you know, uh, there are some comparable pitchers where it does make it hard to make decisions like that. Yeah, I think complicating it for Maeda, too. He took that comebacker to the foot, so I think he was throwing a bullpen today, and that kind of put the whole week in question. wasn't a great matchup. I I had Maeda as a sit for this week, so if he comes out and deals, and we did I'm going to miss and, out. And we will be sitting him, but it, but you know, dropping him was another level where it's like, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it's some some weeks we might want to have Maeda on this roster. So I understand that that feeling of being like, is he is he too good to drop? You know, and then then there's the, you add the complication. Like one of the bids that we had down was for Clark Schmidt over Maeda. <laughs> the model pulls you back in. One great start against a really good lineup <laughs> at home. It looked good with the eye test too. I mean, he had he had the knuckle curve working. He was locating well. I thought he was. I think the, the curve is really out. important because he was throwing the sweeper to lefties, and that's why he got demolished. And so he needs to throw the curve uh, and the four seam and the cutter to to lefties. And (laughs) I think he has the pitch mix to figure it out. He has a really interesting. So you watched him. He has a, does he have a funny way about him? Yeah, I I watched. So I've been watching. He's like prancing. He like prances into his, it's like this weird. It's like, yeah, you know, he's like this, the, the whole, like, it's very interesting. I, 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 I can't give him the like, 
100 seal of approval but i'm hanging on i am hanging on <laughs> and what we ended up not getting him because we had maeda and we didn't feel like going super aggressive so we bid a 17 on him he went for 57 in our main Ooh, see, so one start one good start one good start. Model support plus yeah plus in your budget plus eno's in my in my although i don't know if the guy knows that i'm in his league <laughs> because uh my name's not on it so that helps I think that but, helps. But I think if he bid 57, he, he saw my name somewhere. If, if you see me stare out the window, which is to this side, they're, they're re-roofing the building I used to live in, which is right outside my window. And I'm, I'm grateful every day that I decided to make that little move to the other building. <laughs> yeah. But I just watched a man climb scaffolding three floors with you know no harness or anything. And I'm, I just, I, man, some people... Whatever that man gets paid, it's not enough. Like that, it's just. We went to the top of the Empire State Building, and they were showing, and I think a fair amount of people died. But oh yeah, they were just uh, showing these riveters, then, yeah. like the riveters, how they were working, and they were they what they did was they got these like hot rivets, and then they would throw them in the air, and they'd be on like the fifty fifth floor, or whatever, and on the fifty fourth floor they'd be like making the rivets, they'd throw it up to the fifty fifth floor. The guy who was just standing on a beam would catch it in a in a thing, and then he'd pound it into the thing. And none of them were wearing harnesses; or anything. they're just standing fifty five floors up on this thing. I wouldn't have made uh, it for through me. the previous no, eras of humanity. Like, I would not have survived. <laughs> Evolution would have just taken me out. Uh, one last question to get to before we go. Tony is on the early season power hunt uh, after having a kind of the opposite problem last year. He's just looking for some power because he's got plenty of speed and average right now. So what he's looking for is to basically offset some high average safe floor guys with some power ceiling. He's got guys like Brandon Nimmo, Brandon Marsh, uh, Josh Rojas, DJ LeMayhew, Rodolfo Castro, and Mauricio Dubon. So a lot of average in that group. Uh, so he was wondering, is something like Nimmo for Taylor Ward, is that doable value-wise? I don't know if I'd actually do that. There's some stuff with Taylor Ward that looks a little off at the moment. Uh, Nimmo for Telez. He's looking at trades like that. And I, I was basically saying, let's just broaden this part of the show up to in, in relatively inexpensive sources of power that you believe in. And one of the names that came to mind for me was Hunter Renfro. And here's how I got there. All I did was take a look at the rest of the season projections from the Bat X over at Fangraphs, sorted by home runs. Started scrolling through the list. It's a bunch of guys that are super expensive in trades at the top. But once you get to the high 20s, you start to find some guys that still play every day, that are solid, that their current managers are probably not glued to, that as long as the underlying skills are still intact, I think you're going to get there. They're good oatmeal accumulators, and I think those are the kinds of players you can more easily trade from this sort of average high floor group to go get DJ LeMay, might actually get you Anthony Santander in a trade or DJ LeMay, plus something might get you there, right? You can kind of talk yourself into getting these deals done because it's not trading for early round talent. It's trading for those mid round guys that are outfielder threes or outfielder fours or corner infielders. So a Renfro sort of pop Santander pop for me. I think Eugenio Suarez has been this kind of player for a long time. Um, is there anybody that you really like as sort of like a mid-tier I mean, player, could, but a big source of power? Sort of high on like a Trent Grisham. I mean, it's interesting to me that Trent Grisham and Eloy Jimenez have the same max EV this year mm. uh, and similar barrel rates. It's like, well, I mean, yes, I could tell you to buy low on Eloy, but th I think nobody's going to let you do that. Right. Why That's don't you just go buy high on Trent Grisham, who his owner thinks, you know, oh, this is just a flash in the pan and I need to get out of here as soon as I can. Um, maybe a buy low on Oscar Colas, who actually has uh, a nice max EV, but hasn't been tapping into it. And maybe his owner is, is nervous that, you know, it's never going to come. Um, I, what I've done is sort by max EV and just, uh, I'm looking through slugging, uh, to find the guys, uh, who are, are in trouble slugging wise. Jake Fraley has a good max EV, uh, and poor slugging. Uh, Spencer Torkelson. Oh, look, he's back. He's there again. <laughs> Love you, Spencer. Um, <laughs> uh, Manny Machado. <laughs> I, this is one I don't know if I believe in. Oscar Gonzalez. What do you think? Uh, the Max EV is good, but he, he there's something about him. Does he hit too many grounders, or he just he doesn't barrel it. I'm just I'm not convinced. I think they got a couple prospects that could end up taking some time from him if they don't like what they see. 
Rowdy actually fits. Rowdy was part of the question. Nimmo for Rowdy is pretty fair, I think, as far as like a, an average and runs guy for a. To be fair, like, the guys names guy. I'm saying are not trade Nimmo for. I'm trying to find him names pickups. that be ch- pickups or cheaper names. Yeah, you know? yeah. That's what I'm trying to find. Guys, you could guys you could get for Rodolfo Castro. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I don't know. Uh, David Peralta should be doing better than he's doing. David Peralta, though, I is. Yeah, there's the the Dodgers believed in him, and maybe we should believe in him because a smart team at age 35 wanted to have him on their team. But I don't, I don't know, man. He's it's like bounce back to what I think he's a he's like a low double digit home run guy over a full season. If it's ten the rest yeah. of the way, ten homers with a good average, that'd be probably the best case scenario. Even the projections are down at him an average. I guess he's had max EVs like years. this forever and barrel rates like this forever, so he's not. You know, you're not, he's not a young player where you're like, oh, look, he's going to tap into that raw power. No, man. We've, he's given us a whole career of not quite tapping into his raw power. Yeah. Yes. But hopefully these methods, the methods are the key here. Like looking at yeah. the auction calculator, trying to find similar value that way, looking for the rest of the season projections and looking at the, um, the slugging numbers and max EVs. That's kind of what you're looking for to find some comps and to find that early power. This is a good time to do it. I think we're, we're far enough into the season where everybody's a little antsy. It's not just keeper leagues. I've already got the itch and keeper and dynasty leagues to choose a direction and start making moves. Uh, but I think in redraft, people are starting to say, okay, we're almost a month in. These are my flaws. I want to do something about it now because I don't want to be terrible in a category. I don't want to have to punt a category later because I failed to address it early. So I think you're absolutely right if you're starting to look at other rosters a bit more and start to try to figure out how yours might line up with someone else's Ooh, to get a deal I done. I got one more name. Fran Mill. Whoa, that's, that's waiver wire material. I know. I'm just saying. Uh, I, I sorted by barrel rate instead of max EV, and he popped. 20, top 30 in barrel rate. 20% barrel rate, man. 38% K rate, man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> zero defensive value, so playing time could go bye-bye if it... Uh, uh, by he's projections... He's keeping his head above water right now, though. By projections, it is actually sort of a fringy deep league maneuver that you should consider if you're light on power. I don't know if it, in a 12, I don't think that's going to be the, the solution. Was that the, that was that the context in the beginning? Was it a 12 teamer? This particular league for Tony is a 12. Uh, well, I missed that. I'm sorry, Tony. Most of what I said was useless. <laughs> Congratulations. It's the process, it's all about the journey. <laughs> My biases are laid there. <laughs> yeah, I think they're they're out there for everyone to see. <laughs> I was just doing my like 15 team thing there. <laughs> 20 team dynasty league power sources. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you have a question for a future episode, we might answer a version of it. You can send those our way. Ratesandbarrels at gmail.com is the preferred email address. You can find Eno on Twitter at Eno Saris. You can find me at Derek Ben Riper. If you want to check out the piece we were describing earlier, you can get that on The Athletic. Theathletic.com slash rates and barrels gets you a subscription for $1 a month for the first year. So jump in and get that if you haven't done so already. That's going to do it for this episode of Rates and Barrels. We're back with you with a project prospect on Tuesday. Thanks for listening.